So let's talk about it. So you were, without doubt, the, probably one of the most notorious judges out of the 100. <laughs> <laughs> For good reason. <laughs> Paulus. Oh yeah, that's my name now. Yes. So let me talk about that. Okay. So when did that come about? The when did you Paulus. adopt that name? Uh, officially, I adopted it three years ago. Right. But I've been being called Paulus for... As a nickname. Yeah, since I was 13. Yeah. So my friend Sarah Louise Young, who I was at the awards with, with uh, where I met you, yeah. the QX Awards. Uh, she did Latin at school, but I didn't go to a school that was as posh as hers. So <laughs> I didn't really know what she was doing when she called me Paulus when we first met. I just was like, that's kooky. I just let her call me it. And um, other people have called me it over the years and, uh, and it's never become much of a thing. Just some of my friends call me it. And then I was reading a book on Music Hall by John Major. Did you know that John Major, our ex-Prime Minister's dad, was a music hall performer? Oh, really? Yeah. Hey. yeah. Um, so sometimes he's known as Tom Major, and sometimes he's known as Major Tom. Can you guess where I might be going with this story? Yeah. And that is where David Bowie got the uh, idea for the line, ground control to Major Tom in Space Oddity. Wow. He saw an old poster in an old music hall venue advertising John Major's dad's act. How cool is that? <laughs> God, that's surprising, isn't it? So anyway, I was reading about the history of Music Hall and there was a little piece about a French performer called Paulus who used to come to London all the time and perform in Music Hall in the late uh, 1800s. And I thought, I remembered Sarah nicknaming it me and it was exactly at a time when I wanted to sort of just shake up what I was doing a bit and change my onstage yeah. persona. So I thought, right, let's do that. Like Madonna, keep reinventing yourself. <laughs> yeah, just one word. <laughs> Cher, <laughs> Kylie, Paulus, yeah. Adele. And it was supposed to be for, my, for when I'm in drag, when I'm on stage in drag uh, as a host or a singer or whatever. But um, when I made the TV programme all together now, they, they, they said, oh, you're gonna all have name badges on. And what name do you want? What do you want the name badge to say? And I was like, no, oh, I don't really want it to say Paul because it's such a nondescript, mm. short, unmemorable name. <laughs> <laughs> so I stole the name Paulus from my drag persona for the TV programme, and now I'm called Paulus all the time when I'm a performer. So let's talk about it. So you were, without doubt, the, probably one of the most notorious judges out of the 100. <laughs> <laughs> for good reason. The flamingos died to make this check. Oh, I don't You're like the bad in a Disney film. <laughs> Shut up. Right, okay, we're ready. I'm Paulus, I'm a cabaret host. Shechen. Shechen. Yeah. Shechen. Shechen. <laughs> I performed with Elton John, Matt Lucas, Boy George. I don't know if there was anything missing, I think it was too much, to be honest with you. How can you ever have too much ice cream? <laughs> well, I'm lactose intolerant, so. <laughs> There are thousands and thousands of performers out there. And some are fantastic and some are shocking. What's he called? He's like, is that a light bulb? It's a, a light bulb. <laughs> this could break me. Bring me some oh, no. <laughs> uh, I feel like I've entered a parallel universe in the last few minutes. With the things on your head, are they so that you can contact your home planet? What, what are they for? People have called me a pantomime villain. <laughs> Call me Mr. Grumpy, but I think we all know I'm just saying what everyone else is thinking. I felt that the song was more in control oh. than you were of the song. We need goosebumps. We want, we want goosebumps. goosebumps. Put the air con up. Well, I've got this whole bunch of things that I'm looking for, yeah. and if they make me forget that there's a checklist, yeah, you've got that, to stand that's up. it. Well, you're lying. Oh no, that's there. Oh, that's there. Oh no, that's there as well. Oh, come on. Oh, was it? Was there a story? You know, yeah, you're a big a fan of a story. Yeah, what's the story? <laughs> what's the story? They were living on a prayer, Rob. Weren't you listening? <laughs> I wish 
that Paulus will stand up. That's wishful thinking, Jerry. Some people think that underneath this hard exterior, there's a big softy. And it was so effortless, absolutely stunning, and my heart is full. Oh. Thank you. Don't hold your breath. Oh, that was a waste of leg muscle. We talk about people on re these reality shows who present an extended version of themselves. Mm. So with you, how much of it was you and how much of it was this extended, elaborate version, would you say? 60 40. Mm. So they never told me what to say. They were brilliant in that way. They never told any of us what to yeah. say, how to vote, or anything. But they saw something in me when I interviewed and auditioned to take part. What they saw in me was complete and utter disdain for television in general right. and competitions and a mistrust of television companies. So when I went along for my audition, uh, I was just a bit like, what is this? What do you want? And they skeptical. Yeah, it was. I was just very skeptical. And they showed me clips of. Sorry, that's my cat going. No, no. <laughs> they showed me clips of uh, people on X Factor, I think it was, and they said, "Would you join in with this singer?" And I was like, "Only to drown them out." No, which I, which was true. I think it was actually uh, Rylan that they showed yes, me, and it yeah, wasn't yeah. very good. I no, no idea who he was. Never seen him before in my life. Um, and then I went into a room with the researcher and they, they were all bouncy and, and young and excited and they're like, so, why do you want to be a member of the 100? And I was like, I don't know if I do, I'm here to interview you. And I just, I, I, I just don't bow down to the, the mecca that is TV and I'm so aware of how they can edit you mm. and how they have all the control. And I just went in really skeptically and I, I, even when they said we want you to do it and for some reason I decided I'd go I was still like what is this <laughs> and I saw one of the producers pointing me out to the cameramen when they were setting up on set on the first day and I thought oh why why is he pointing at me and then live studio audience came in and the show started cameras were running and Rob Beckett the host the mm. very first time he ever spoke to me he came up to me he sat next to me shoved a microphone in my face lights, cameras, live audience, he said, so, Paulus, you're our panto villain. And it wasn't a question. Right. So I had to go, am I? Right, okay, good, I can do that, fine. And gave it to them. So there was never a premeditated decision not to stand up. That was kind of genuine. No, right? my judging was all, has yeah. always been completely and utterly honest. I am that hard to impress. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I just am. Um, I had a very long and specific list of criteria of what I was looking for and it was longer and more specific than anybody else on the panel. It's just the way it is. And what type of things were on that list? Oh well everybody that watches the programme knows that <laughs> storytelling. <laughs> but uh, I just I've never been very excited by uh, singers who uh, use the ornaments or perhaps another word might be uh, the vocal acrobatics that they ha might mm. have at their disposal in order to impress. Right. And those things are impressive, but I, but I think it's very sad if that's all you get from a performer and, uh, and there's no other layer of character or story. Um, and you know, uh, the way these programs get cut often is that the audience have to applaud when they get to a, like, the money shot, the big mm. note, and I'm like, oh please, that's so, that's so little there. There's not, there's nothing of substance there. That's not what this is about for me. That's not what's interesting. And that when I go into drama schools, that's not what I teach. I teach people how to act through a song. Um, so I, th that's where my approach is coming from, really. My acting through song and my approach to cabaret itself uh, is, is about that. So storytelling, eye contact, which I believe without which you cannot be uh, an interesting performer mm. who uh, engages with other people. Uh, it's because I've worked in cabaret for 30 years next year. Um, and one of the greatest uh, beliefs about the principles of cabaret is that there isn't a fourth wall between you and the audience. Yes. Um, that means that you've got to acknowledge that they're there, right? 
And I know that people in your life don't stare each other in the eye for the entire conversations, but they do look at each other. And when they ask a question, when, if I said to you, hi, Phil, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Right, I wait. I would wait for an answer. I wouldn't, which is what people do on stage and think they're doing cabaret, go, hey, how are you? Anyway, great to be here. It's yeah. like, what? <laughs> you asked a question and then you ran straight over the moment that should have been the answer. So I can't, storytelling, eye contact. Yes, I'm also looking for really great vocals as well because it was, was it £50,000 that was available to win? So, yeah. you know, yeah. Um, and, and general stage presence. Those were the big ones. I'm trying to remember. It's been a while now. But you say that women that, are those set rules? Or do you think there's ever an occasion where somebody catches your eye and changes your... Yeah, there, there are moments and there was on the programme at least once where they're so mes mesmerising, they have such star quality or whatever yeah. it is, that you forget the rules. You forget your checklist. And if they make you forget your checklist, job done. Yeah. So I start, because it would be unfair not to, with the same checklist for every single contestant. And I try, I, so if you watch very carefully, I'm, I am concentrating like, Bilio, much more yeah. than a lot of the judges, because I want to make sure that they're doing the things that I'm looking for. I'm going, good, that's there, that's yeah. there, good, that's there. But, you know, if they take you to another place with their performance and you forget to do the checklist, yeah. then they've won. Then you stand up, of course. Exactly. Yeah. It's funny because I was watching the Judy film and you watch her later performance. I mean, it was Renee Zellweger doing Judy. Yeah. But she was still kind of embodying... Judy's mannerisms and her disconnection with the audiences in the last few concerts. Well, right. was it a disconnection or was it a reconnection? It's kind of... And I looked, cause it, particularly with Keith Ramsey, mm -hmm. who kind of has that quality that... I mean, he plays on it now. Yes. But then certainly, whenever I've seen him perform, he makes a conscious choice not to, to con look at the audience. Yeah, and yet there's something captivating about it, isn't there? I think there's, uh, you know, I think there's, you can break the rules if you mm. know what the rules are. Yeah. If it, yes. uh, you, but yeah. You, ha you have to be able to do something before you then, as you just said, consciously decide yeah. not to do it. Yeah, yeah, so right, like he knows the rules and he's very yeah. well trained. He's very like Judy, actually. We, we yeah. did a, uh, the same build together at Crazy Cox earlier yeah. this year. And uh, yes, it's, it's like, <laughs> Who is that? that Judy Garland has yeah. re been reincarnated. I think he should have played her for the film. <laughs> Did Maybe. you enjoy it? Did you watch it? I'm going tomorrow. <sighs> I, I was like, do I see Joker or do I see I Judy? know, that's Joker, the, Judy. They were on my list. Yeah, I wasted a movie trip uh, out a couple of weeks ago because we went to see the chapter two of It. Mm, which was just yeah. so appalling. <laughs> I didn't realise how supernatural it it used to be kind of like psychological mm, yeah and then it just became bizarre I yeah i mean i saw the i saw the 90s version with tim yeah. curry in it yeah. and uh i love tim curry um and i've always found the book and this story interesting so i hoped that given time they'd they would and maybe have learned some things from the yeah. first version that they made and tried to make it better but it has exactly the same problems you know yeah. a great big spider that is really quite laughable and can't exactly. be cgi'd well in any way it just comes and ruins the film yeah <laughs> and they they talk about it for the entire film i don't know if you've seen it but um the, the characters right an ending. yeah and even <laughs> stephen king is in it and says and that line yeah. himself which i think is okay so so you know you're getting in front of that that issue but it takes away the problem it doesn't take away from the problem that the whole film is trash. <laughs> yeah. yeah, all right, all right. There's a spider coming and you're sort of apologising before it turns up. But what about the first two and a half hours you made us sit through? Because it's all terrible. Part one's interesting. I like part one. Yeah. Mm, gosh. Exactly. So we talked about editing and the way the show portrayed you. Were you happy when you watched it back? Um, How did you think it went? Sometimes I think oh, I've got too much glitter on my head. That's wrong. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Professional hazard. How, how did I think it went? Um, Do you think you were edited right? Uh, I, I actually think the editors did a tremendous yeah. job. Yeah, a very good job, and 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 much much more fairly than I thought they right. would. I don't know if 
the contestants uh, feel like that. But yeah, I think they could have done horrendous things to us judges, and they didn't. Um, the editing of that show, both series and the Christmas special, is is brilliant. And if I ever get to meet the editors, I will shake their hands. This was one thing that happened in series two, and it's like that's the wrong way around. I can't, I can't quite remember what it is. It's like it it looks like I've stood up before. Uh, uh, it was the Christmas special. Right. It's Omid Jalili. Uh, Omid Jalili um, uh, was doing really, really great. And then he sings this most horrible, horrible note. And they've cut it to make it look like I stand up after the horrible note. But I've already stood up before right. it. And they've made it look the other yeah. way around. So that's awful because I would never have stood up <laughs> after hearing that note. But I'm not allowed to sit down again. That's one of the I rules. I was about to say, so yeah, no, you, can't change, are on, you, can't... you can't change your mind, right. which is often why I wait till the very last minute yeah, you to be stand. Sure. Yeah, because, because you're still giving them a chance. So yeah. people think I'm being unkind. No, I'm waiting. I'm giving you a chance. Yeah. Um, and then in the feedback, when Omid and I are talking with Rob Beckett, they don't use the bit where I comment on the awful note. So, you know, that, I think that's the, the only thing I could complain about. Otherwise, the editing was fantastic. And either from being in the show or just by watching it, has it changed your opinion of reality talent contests? I think that the biggest issue that I and most of the cabaret community have always had with talent contests is Simon Cowell yeah. and his company yeah. and I have no difference of opinion to them this is the, oh, it's that time of year it's a bit like getting yeah. ready for Halloween do you just sort of get phone calls and emails at around this time of year all of the people that work in the same industry as I do get them from Simon Cowell and his research well not from Simon Cowell he doesn't phone no. can you imagine uh, from his research well, sort of, yeah. <laughs> and I was like Simon ah, you want a year off I'm your man. Um, I actually said that to the researcher this year. I was like, no, I'm not interested in... They wanted me to help them find acts this year. And I was like, okay, no, I'm not interested in that. I'm not a booker or an agent anymore. But if Simon needs a holiday, you know where I am. Um, yeah, I, I think it's him. I think that's the problem, quite frankly. Because Altogether Now has proven to me that you, they're not all the same. Yeah, it's not always it a bad experience. All. Yeah, I seem to. But then sadly, it's been capped at two seasons. The but BBC are not recommissioning yeah. a third. Now, I don't know what that really means. I don't know if that means that somebody will try and get it mm -hmm. out of their hands. Uh, it seems unclear where where it is being held, the programme, but uh, my colleagues who know a lot more about TV than I do think that probably a five-year deal would have been struck. Yeah. And so if some other TV channel really, really wants it, they're going to have to pay the BBC out like... Yeah the Bake Off was bought out by yeah. Channel 4 um, in order to get it before three more years go by and then we will have lost a bit of momentum by then I think yeah so it's a, it's a bit of a shame but they tasked us with a really difficult job in series two and I think that's one of the reasons it didn't get recommissioned and what was that well what I was told by the TV uh, by the program makers remarkable was that the BBC had tasked them with getting 18 to 25 year olds to watch right. the programme. Do you know the average age of the BBC One Saturday night television viewer? The average age. What do you think it is? It's certainly not between 18 and 25, <laughs> is it? Okay, so have a guess. People who stay in or people who would tend to watch it on the yeah, not player? Streamed. Yeah, it's got to be yeah, watching live. Live, yeah, yeah. It has to be the older generations. 50, 60 plus. 75 years 70, old. Yeah. Average. Yeah. So what they did in order to do that, and I, I think they did, uh, they made a lot of really good choices in order to achieve that, that task that they'd been set. The contestants were younger. Mm -hmm. The kooky sort of novelty contestants weren't in series two. You know, the blokes dressed up as two gherkins that we had in series one, the bus drive, the cabbie drivers yeah. uh, and people like that. They were all gone in series two. Nobody under 40. Uh, contestant wise probably nobody under 35 the song choices were all a lot younger as well and I know from people writing to me saying I, my grandma and my granddaughter you know we watched my 17 year old and my four year old we this is the only thing we can watch yeah. as a family because we're all interested in it 
and when I got the song list, because believe it or not, I do, do still learn the songs, even though I don't obviously <laughs> join in with any of them. I have to learn all the songs in case I, that one song is the one that makes me stand up. Um, I was like, well, so I probably knew two thirds of the songs in series one without having to be you know, taught them. And we Ooh. are taught them all. Um, other way around for series two, I knew a third. Right. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. So. I, that was a worry even when filming I was like oh this is different and I think it's going to alienate some people and maybe that's why maybe that's why no third series well it's interesting because when we talk about X Factor the fact that they've now rebranded it with a celebrity series and if you look at the lineup within that they've got a group formed of YouTube bloggers yeah yeah so it definitely is seem to be targeting a, a younger demographic or a certainly a different demographic than mm. people who watch TV. Yeah, well, All Together Now did that as well. Yeah, um, they um, the judging panel we we got a lady called Talia Ma. Now I didn't know who Talia was before we made the program. In fact, I didn't know who she was until after we made the program. When we did the press launch for series two, I found out who she was and who her boyfriend was. Um, and three lads that so sat near us, three brothers, they were all YouTube mm, stars and they've yes. all got yeah. thousands and thousands of followers. And I didn't know them because I'm 45. I, I, I don't know anything about YouTube. Um, uh, and they deliberately injected these people throughout because of how many followers they have. And, uh, and they were great. They were great members of the, of the panel. They were great members of the family, as it were. Um, uh, but that's very deliberate, just like Joe Sugg being in yeah. uh, uh, on Strictly and now in Waitress. Waitress and, exactly. you know, yeah. Yeah. How do you feel about that when you see them? Like, I mean, it's, he caused a lot of controversy when... I just want the job to go to someone that can do it. Right. Um, it's really difficult. Do you think it's unfair to judge him before seeing him in oh the God, show? Oh God, absolutely, yeah. I mean, he's probably been, been to drama school for three years yeah. for all we friggin' know. Uh, it's really difficult because there might not be a job for the rest of the cast if you don't bring in a celebrity to yeah. save a show. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I, I wish it wasn't a problem, but it is a problem and I don't, I don't think that theatre producers are going out of their way to, way to try and, you know, to try and pay. I mean, do you think a theatre producer wants to have to pay no. Joe Sugg what Joe Sugg is asking for to be in exactly. Waitress? I don't think that. So. I think they'd be delighted to pay a graduate of Arts Ed, where I teach, Marvelous School. <laughs> Phil went there. Um, but that's not the way the world works. Yeah. And... I don't yeah, think it ever is no. the way the world has worked. It's just that now we all have Twitter and we can complain about it more outwardly, you know? So yeah. the, it's it's a bit like this the conversation on uh, sort of positive discrimination. You know, I was talking with my yoga teacher the other day. We were talking about uh, people of colour and women being better represented on television and in politics or anywhere, everywhere, you know? And we were talking about the fact that it's important that they are but we were also discussing the fact that I hope they can also do the job. <laughs> do you Absolutely. know what I mean? I'm not, yeah. not trying, I'm not making any suggestion of any one in particular, but I would like, I would like the person that can do the job best to get the job. But also the nation needs to be um, represented yeah. fairly. And if we, until we get there, these other issues seem secondary. And I, and I get that, I understand that. And I'm a white middle-aged man, so I'm not really even allowed to talk about these things. The fact that I'm gay means I'm allowed to say as yeah, much as I've said, and little now I must stop. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about your YouTube persona, because you've started to develop that, haven't you? Yeah. In the past uh, year or so. I have, and now my phone's gone dodgy, so I'm buying another one. <laughs> I'm going to do but it properly. How have you found it? Is it just something that is alien to you, or something you're kind of quite well, relishing? The... Well, like I said before, I've spent 30 years working with live audiences and not just performing in front of live audiences. I work with live audiences. Ooh. I respond to how they're feeling and what's going on in the room. In Cabaret, if you drop a tray, of, if the waitress drops a tray of glasses, you deal with the fact that she's dropped or he's dropped the tray of glasses. If a phone goes off, you grab the person's phone and you speak to the person on the other end or, or you put it down your leggings or whatever. So, yeah, doing it at home with just a camera, no, and, and like, oh, there's, there's no reaction. There's no immediate reaction. Gosh, so that's yes. nice because nobody, I don't have to go out. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't washed for weeks. Um, but that, yes, yeah, so that presents a different challenge. You're yeah. kind of having to reinvent yeah. your act. 
it, it presents a different uh, being being live and making something alive it, it is very different uh, it, I'm finding it interesting I'm finding it fun I don't know how long I'll do it for or if it will ever gain any traction yeah. I've got this uh, this sort of poster on my wall that uh, in my office upstairs that I made last April and it says it just says in big pink and black writing it just says will it be fun question mark because I have very little control over what happens to me like most of the people in the world I don't know you know what's gonna happen to me from one day to the next but what I feel I've got a bit of a handle on is whether or not I can say yes or no to doing something that seems like it might be fun yeah. and you, you've got a segment called takes on yeah which just seems to be you complaining about things. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's just me complaining. Yeah, it is me complaining. But uh, because that's what I'm like. And so my husband was just like, well, maybe you should just put this stuff on YouTube rather than just yeah. shouting at me <laughs> about these whole things. Uh, uh, this started really, I think, because I, I worked in the service industry from quite a young age. So my mother in the 80s, when I grew up uh, in Kent, um, my mother did the catering for most events. So in our part of Kent, you couldn't really get married or get christened or die without her doing the volumons for it. She was pretty prolific. And I worked for her as a waiter and then a head waiter at a very young age. I was head waiter for her for weddings for 200 by the time I was 15. I mean, she wasn't there. I yeah. was in charge and she was at another wedding. Um, and so standards have always mattered to yeah. me standards of service and so in a, in a restaurant or even a cafe or in a shop I'm really really susceptible to a lack of uh, thank you and please and sir and madam and, and, and eye contact and stuff and the older I get the worse that gets because <laughs> well because I, I don't actually blame I don't actually blame the person that's serving me uh, if they are serving me badly and I don't get served badly everywhere I go no. and it's not always young people that do it although it, there does seem to be a sort of colloquialism that's just slipped into like hi mate how are you pal and like do you know how much I'm paying for this dinner what about sir yeah. what about some eye contact what about some thank you um, but I, but it's not their fault the, it's the fault of middle management Nobody's training these yeah. people. I think it is a change of time where people are getting paid less and they're, they're not investing in the training. What do they care? No. You know? <laughs> what do they care? It's, it's sad. And if we take being a waiter as an example, I think it's very sad in this country that there is less respect yeah. for it than in Italy or Spain. Most other countries in Europe, actually. To be a waiter is a respected job that you mm. would do for your entire life and be well rewarded for. And we don't, you know, that's just something you do whilst you're a student, you know, and, you know, until they're all thrown out on the 31st of October, what foreigners do for us, you know. And uh, I think people have really have a very r nasty attitude towards waiting staff. And I think waiting staff, probably because people have a bad attitude towards them, have got a bad attitude towards the job and customers in general. So it's this horrible cyclical sort of, you know, I'm not trying to blame waiting staff. I've been a waiter and I know how horrible and rude customers can yeah. be. And I have been the horrible and rude customer as well, mostly because I feel that the service has been bad. So it just goes round and round and round in a big circle. Yeah, so my videos are just sort of me venting about, you know, being made to be put on an emailing list because I bought a pair of trousers. It's like, what? <laughs> I went to Rose's Thai kitchen in Soho, just off Compton Street the other day for um, for one, I just had a glass of tap water and some pad thai and I was in a hurry and I was working whilst I was eating. I was in and out of there in 25 minutes, I think. And when the lady brought the bill, she also brought a, a machine uh, with a survey on it. And I, yes, they she do didn't that ask me, she just left it with me and she said, oh, this is to fill out. She didn't say, will you fill it out? <laughs> I was just mm. like, so you're halfway through before you even think, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. What am I doing this for? So she, it was about like five questions and then give us your email address. And I, I, I just want my pad thai and I want to say thank you and I want to pay for it, you know. I thought you'd love a chance to complain. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
until that point in the transaction, I'd had a lovely time. But now I'm publicly being really, really uh, annoyed about Rosa's pad tie, aren't I? You see, so they've shot themselves in the foot there. Yeah, that so there, didn't it? Just think, like, it, it feels like work. Everything you do, everything we do now, and yeah. everything we buy, every time we go online, I mean, it's like, Airbnb, Uber, eBay, you must give feedback for everything all the time. And now the more recent thing on eBay is after you've given them feedback, which I, I do very diligently. I always say exactly the same thing as because I'm asked to remember what it is I'm giving feedback for. I just go, all good, thanks. Excellent service. Unless there's a problem. Yeah. They never get five stars, they get four. You get five stars if you come and suck me off. <laughs> you get four stars. All good, thanks. And then you get an e then I get a message from eBay telling me off for saying the same thing every time. I actually get told off for giving the feedback because they don't like the fact that it's repetitive. Oh, interesting. And now there's a new one where you have to review the product. What do you think of this pair of marigold gloves? <laughs> I think it's a pair of marigold. What do you mean? God. <laughs> I'm just a grumpy old man, Phil. That's basically okay. the situation. So back to that question of a, an expansion of yourself. It's not, it was you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you're starting to understand. Yeah. I am. Yeah. I'm starting to see what those producers saw when they just hired you. Do your job and leave me alone and stop asking for freaking feedback. I was paid to give feedback. <laughs> <laughs> so we've talked about your TV judge yeah. work. And you've got variety, you've got a whole skill set in your basket. Have I? Yeah, so let's talk more about other elements. Let's talk about drag. Oh, um... Or so you call it gender fluidity with your act, I guess. No, no, drag's fine. I don't care what you call me, really. Um, I mean, I'm delighted for Sam Would you call Smith, yourself a drag queen? Um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll call myself anything. I'll, uh, people, it's not up to me. Mm. It's not up to me what, what I get called. It's up to other people. I do drag. Yeah. I get into drag. I have been a drag queen. Um, do I call myself a drag queen? No, I think I, I think I say I do drag, but you know. Um, what do you have matter? a drag name when you... Paulus. Paulus. Yeah, but I used to be Trinity Million. Okay. Yeah, when I was a lot thinner and younger and prettier and I shaved a lot more of my body hair and facial hair <laughs> as well because Paulus doesn't shave his beard. Although, if you, do you, have you been watching the UK Drag Race? I've seen clips. I haven't seen, seen my clips. colleague Davina De Campo in full yeah, swing. So we I know like half the panel. I've worked with all yeah. uh, most of these guys actually, yeah. Because um, there's a few in there who are embracing the body hair. There's one in particular oh, good for who them. doesn't shave his armpits or yeah. chest hair. Gorilla drag. Yeah. Gorilla with a U, not exactly. gorilla. Um, yeah. Um, I used to be called Trinity Million and I created Trinity 20 years ago. And did you have the wig? Yeah, I had yeah. wig. I had three pairs of tights because I was obsessed with people not seeing my leg hair. I shaved my arms, my wrists, my hands, my fingers. That's commitment. My armpits, my chest. I shaved three times. I shaved my face uh, once, down, twice, up. Woods. I was completely obsessed with not having any sort of yeah. five o'clock shadow. Um, yeah, I was very, very beautiful. I was very convincing. I once performed in a, at a wedding in Yorkshire in, uh, as Trinity and the bride said to me like four years later, she messaged me about something. She said, we're still trying to ex explain to some of the older guests that you weren't a real woman. <laughs> I was very, very That's convincing. And uh, I used to sing Victoria Wood songs and fascinating Aida songs and, and stuff from musicals and things. And I just got sort of a bit old and tired and, and lazy and uh, yeah. I killed her off after a while because I was worried I'd never find a lover. And then I found my husband like <laughs> two weeks later. Um, and then I didn't really do anything for a while, drag wise, and then, and then created Paulus three years ago. Yeah. And that's just sort of all the things that, that had got annoying about drag had, had been removed. You just yeah. made a big list of things. Okay, so what is it that, that made you want to stop doing drag other than the fact that I thought no one would ever, you know, love me? Wig is annoying. Three pairs of tights, legs can't breathe is annoying. And it just made this big list. I'm like, well, just stop doing them. Stop doing them. There's not a rule book. So you reinvented to... your own... Yeah. Style. Yeah, because, you know, is there a rule book about what drag is or isn't? No. If there is, I think it's been ripped up by people like, like Holstar. 
yeah. um, you know, who's a drag with a fanny, as she says, and, <laughs> uh, and, and loads of other people. And the current debate around uh, who RuPaul will have on uh, their show. Yeah. No, no trans. Where no do you vaginas. sit on this? Uh, yeah. I mean, they're making a TV program and they've got a very specific set of criteria yeah. that they've got to adhere to um, to make the broadcaster happy. Um, and I've learned a little bit about how much you have to keep the broadcaster yeah. happy. And it makes sense that trans people and drag performers with vaginas uh, uh, and and others are questioning that and uh, and making a noise about that. But sadly, there's still some people uh, sitting at home uh, who haven't ever been to a drag show, maybe never even been to a big city or even left the town that they live in, uh, in, in other little pockets of this country, that watching Drag Race UK alone is a massive, massive deal for, yeah. and is breaking down barriers, is breaking down stigmas around drag, and of course, homosexuality. Not that all drag queens are homosexual, but a lot of them are. And and give it time, I guess, is what I would say. It's a bit like um, it's a bit like the debate of, of uh, same-sex couples yeah, on Strictly and Dancing, Dancing on Ice. Ice. You know, give it time. And again, that could be attributed to the broadcaster, like you say. ITV probably have more leniency or more undoubtedly flexibility undoubtedly. than BBC. Yeah, the BBC could never be the st you know, the, the vanguard of that. They couldn't. No, no. Uh, but they did discuss it heavily last yeah. year. You know, so. I don't know. I I, I know I'm going to sound old. <laughs> I just I just think it's important to give people time to get their heads around yeah. things. Uh, when I was, you know, 21, 22 years old and I would meet people that say to me, uh, you know, you're the uh, you're the only gay person I've ever met. And they wanted to ask lots of questions. You know, some, a straight man from Essex in their 40s and 50s. Yeah. And, uh, and they weren't unkind. They weren't trying to be antagonistic. They were genuinely were, were intrigued and wanted to understand. And I would gently and slowly and as kindly as I could answer their questions. And, you know, and I've been asked this a million times before. <laughs> you know, uh, and they, you know, it wasn't too personal. It wasn't like, are no, you top exactly. or bottom? Or, 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 you know, who is Martha and who is Arthur and stuff like that. But they just wanted to understand how do you know you're gay? You know, what's it like to come out and stuff like that? And, and I remember even back then, almost 25 years ago, sort of having a, a sort of wry smile to myself thinking, I, this could go one of two ways. I could be really, really angry about being interrogated like this or I could take this as op an opportunity to educate somebody yeah. now the person I'm thinking of that that man from Essex I would call him an ally now yeah uh, and I'm and I hope in my tiny little way I've done my bit to convert an ally well, that's it for anybody who takes an interest and is genuine they're not looking to chastise you they're just genuinely taking an interest and wanting to know more and sometimes I see uh, the, the, there's a there's a very big dose of uh, of anger and vitriol or coming out with the with the message of we're not being represented, mm. don't leave us out, you know, we're, we're over here as well. And I personally, that's never been my way. Um, <laughs> so yes, I can be harsh. <laughs> yes, I can be scathing. But when it comes to things like that, actually, softly, softly, catchy monkey. Uh, it is is my way of thinking, but that's not everyone's way, and there's probably room for both in the world, and we'll get there. You know. But I think we are, because if we talk about the QX Cabaret Awards that we were both at, yeah. the I, something that kind of got me when I was in that room with such a collective group of people. Mm. I'd just been to see Downton Abbey a few days before, where they have a very poignant scene where one of the characters is, is taken to a, a speakeasy gay bar. And there I am. This is set in like the early yeah, 20s. It, it's set right in, uh, uh, I think, late 20s. But oh, yeah. okay, right. So we're talking 50 years ago. And there we are in this brilliant room full of brilliant people mm. on embankment, not having to worry about police barging in or getting arrested. No. And being able to express ourselves and be who we want and dress how we want and yeah. not be judged and not be have people 
quizzes and yeah. interrogators. And people with Downs being celebrated. Yes, that was and drag beautiful. And kings being celebrated and people of colour being celebrated. And, and actually those guys, you know, the, they were the, the ones that were winning the awards yeah. that night. And so yeah. they damn well should be yeah. as well. And uh, and about time too. That's yeah. what award ceremonies should be for. Exactly. Really. And I think... They did a really, really good job. Yeah. It was a really brilliant... From that point of view, QX did a trip. Um, the venue was horrible. But <laughs> <laughs> no offence, <laughs> Uncle House, but it wasn't a great choice of venue. Um, but yeah. Yeah. But they're starting out. They've got a, it's the inaugural awards. Somewhere. Yeah, I'm sure next year, hopefully. It well, will the get first year there. of the awards I ran was not the venue that we used wasn't as good as the venue we had four years yeah. later at Cafe de Paris. You've got to start somewhere. Yeah, exactly. I'm just very glad that they're doing it. It's really yeah. nice. It's exactly. really nice. It's nice to be um, nominated for something because when I ran the London Cabaret Awards. Uh, I made it a rule, <laughs> just in case anybody wanted to nominate me for something that they couldn't because I'd created them. So for the four years that the London Cabaret Awards ran, um, you're, you're just sort of, sort of sitting there make, helping to make it happen and, and celebrating the community, which is what I wanted to do, but sort of going, hmm, I can't have an award. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really nice to go to the QX Awards as a nominee, as a shortlister. Yeah. It was really cool. <laughs> and let's talk about Prize Got Talent. Oh yeah. That's what about it? it? Well, it's great, isn't it? That's all right, yeah. I don't know. Uh, I haven't been involved for a couple of years now. I've been But you helped establish and set that up. So are you... Well, I've been a judge. I yeah. haven't really been involved heavily, like uh, like uh, other people, like Michael Twaits and Ian Massa Harris and these yeah. other people. I know I've just sort of uh, swooped in and, and and done my bit, but no, I haven't. I didn't help set it up. Uh, I don't. I don't think that would be fair to say. Uh, but uh, if they ever want me to go back and do some more, I'd be happy to talk to them. The problem is that with things like uh, Pride Scott Talent and Drag Idol and things like that, uh, I often get asked, you know, will you come and uh, judge one of the heats? Uh, the RVT often asks me to go and do Drag Idol. And I, I'm in theory, I'm very happy to, but the thing I, I have to remind them is that they're going to get the, the persona, the TV persona, because that's what I am now. That's, that's the yeah. judge that I am now. I am. I have no shame about the fact that that is how I judge. It is what I am. Ha, have made a little bit of a name for myself for, and uh, and may continue to do so. But often these uh, events want, and I understand why they want uh, it to be slanted on a po in a, in the positive, and they don't want any negative comments. They want it to just all be happy comments and good comments and stuff like that. And it was like doesn't quite do it for my brand you know so will I come along for the evening and give my time to support this event yes I'd like to will I come along for the evening uh, and give my time and support this event and be something I'm not <laughs> that isn't my brand mm, I don't really know if I can or should do that because it doesn't really make yeah. sense and it wouldn't make sense to the public either you know so keeping with your brand yeah and the public of Ipswich, they're going to be treated to Mr. Panto. Are you playing a villain? Yeah, I'm playing year? an ugly sister. I can't think why they <laughs> a terrible mistake in the casting. You know, uh, uh, um, I think her name, uh, Hannah is her name from S Club 7. Yes. She's, uh, she's in it. So you've got Hannah, you've got Mr. Adam Garcia. This is the only reason you're bringing this up. Is this is the only reason, because I will be there. You want to talk about Sat Adam Garcia? Well, well, don't we all? <laughs> All right, then, let's talk about Adam I'm Garcia. I'm sure you'll be talking a lot about him when you... I keep telling people I'm in Panther with Ad Andy Garcia. And they're like, are you <laughs> sure Panther. you're in Panther with Andy Garcia? And I'm like, yeah! <laughs> no, keep getting it So wrong. the Panther's Aladdin. No, it's Cinderella. Oh, is it Cinderella? I'm the ugly sister. And you're the ugly One sister. One of the ugly sisters. Damn. With my best friend. I'm really pleased because... Um, Gavin, my best friend, Gavin Ashbury, he was in this production when it was in Newcastle last right. year. And his ugly sister got a better offer. And so they <laughs> said to him, will you come back next year? But also, have you got a mate that you'd like to recommend? Because your ugly sister's scarpered. And he said, oh, well, my friend's just been a baddie on telly. And uh, he's done Panto. And so why don't you see him? So, so are you looking forward to it? I am looking forward to it because it's been a long time since I've done anything uh, as, as a ensemble cast yeah. and uh, I haven't seen my friend Gavin for a long time so if I have to be away from home and my cat and my husband for an entire month in a town that isn't one that I know <laughs> then hanging out with my mate my best mate for Christmas time is the best way I can think of doing it and if that means I get to hang out with Andy Garcia and a 
Adam <laughs> Garcia <laughs> in a dressing again. room. Then, then all for the better. And and a member of S Club Seven. Oh, exactly. I think she's playing the fairy godmother. I assume there's been some mistake, and that was supposed to be my part. And <laughs> she was supposed to be. I don't know. I don't know. Who knows? Yeah. I mean, there no are you going to come? Of course. Are you? Oh, good. We can go for a drink afterwards. Absolutely. Or before. Or well, during. I'll yeah, just between just, shows. Do you know there's an adults only product, uh, performance? Is there? Yeah. yeah. That's why, that's the, I mean, that was the clincher. Oh, I'm definitely there. I was like, okay, so it's a short run. Good, because I'm quite lazy. <laughs> uh, best friends in it. Okay, good. That's a tick. And also, really short run. We do two weeks rehearsal and then just two weeks performances. Um, so I was like, tick, 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 done by New Year's Eve. I'll be back in this room with champagne in my hand by midnight on New Year's Eve. Amazing. Um, unless there's a traffic jam. Uh, but on the 20th of December, there's a one-off adults only performance. So if you like pantomimes, but you don't like children and so say all of us. And Adam uh, Garcia. Yeah, and Adam Garcia. If you like Adam Garcia, and if you want S to Club. meet Phil, uh, <laughs> the adults only very, very filthy version um, oh, at the Regent's Theatre will be on on the 20th of December for one uh, night only. Because you, you, you enjoy adult pantos, don't you? Done a I few. produced them for yeah. 15 years, yeah. I produced and written and performed in them on and off on a boat on the Thames for 15 years. So yeah. I should know what I'm doing for that performance. That will be the only performance I but will you know, know what, what I'm doing. Yeah, the rest of them I'll be like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? Am I to not swear now or don't swear now? Okay. <laughs> but talking of children, I mean, you you also teach. Mm. So I mean, you're not. Uh, I don't teach children though. Well, some of Because my DBS check <laughs> <laughs> young adults and uh, young adults I do uh, I have taught young adults yeah I'm talking to a place in Kingston at the moment who work with um, uh, 14 15 16 year olds that have been removed from school okay. about going and running workshops with them but I've worked with uh, as a mentor and a teacher I've worked with uh, magistrates people in the pharmaceutical industry drag queen singers grandmothers yeah you know I've been teaching for 20 years now do you enjoy teaching Yes, I like it very much. I'm, I'm really, I'm really surprised how much I enjoy it. Yeah. Because, uh, if I'm really honest, for the first, <laughs> think the first twelve years, I was just I had complete and utter imposter syndrome. I didn't really think I deserved to be there and hold that space, and 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 didn't think I had anything to say or to share, and was just sort of winging it. Really, I remember I came out of my first class twenty years ago, um, and I'd had one uh, one student who had been quite uh, uh, just just questioned a lot of stuff and said, "But why? But why do we do that? And why do we do that?" <laughs> I was like, God, on my first day, shut up, let's do it. Um, and uh, so I sort of debriefed with my friend, and she said, "Okay, so here's here's a couple of things. Number one, the, here's here's my first gift to you," she said. The word facilitator, facilitating, uh, holding a space and facilitating for a group of people is a much more powerful way of approaching things than the idea of teaching. And I'm the teacher and I know all the answers and you're gonna do what I say. And I was like, oh, that's, that's canny that. And I've been holding on to that for 20 years and I will hold on to it till the day I die. Um, and also she said, it's okay to not know. You know, so if, you, if somebody asks you a question and you don't know, just say, I don't know let's find out yeah yeah and use that opportunity and that time and that space to do so and in the last few years the the workshops i've done with people sometimes teaching cabaret sometimes acting through song sometimes clowning and i teach people about comparing as well because i've done that for 30 years now on stage um the letters and and cards and thank yous that i get afterwards um they're better than any round of applause I've ever had. Yeah. They're, they're amazing. Um, they make me, oh, I feel all silly now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, they're really, really special and, uh, and they give me a tremendous amount. So I'm, I'm very grateful to, my, to all of my students for, for exploring with me. I hope I'll keep doing it for a long, long time. Yeah. Good. What type of theatre do you like? I'm, I'm still exploring this, Phil. Um, I've got a very good friend who's given me a lot of free tickets to the theatre in the last five, six years uh, because of her job in ticketing. And I've been very lucky to go and see like the premiere or the first week of 
huge uh, West End musicals. Um, and, and she knows this, so she's not going to be surprised to hear me say this, but I'm a bit over it. <laughs> mm. uh, the, the sort of formulaic yeah. convey about like a West End musical leaves me cold now. I, mean, I saw Waitress before Joe Sugg was in it and I did not enjoy it. And I love Sarah Bareilles' music. Yeah. Um, and there were very talented people in that show. I did not enjoy that show. And my damn friend made me stay to the second half. I was like, oh, got it. I want to go home. Um, I, I just think they're being churned out and uh, and it's a formula and it's a conveyor belt and uh, and it's a and it's a, a box ticking exercise and and that's really that's a real shame and I need to find other stuff that excites me and I, I, maybe that's physical theatre maybe that's dance maybe it's children's theatre I just saw an ad just before you arrived I was looking at my phone and an advert for the stick man um, the children's yeah. play based on the children's book came up apparently it's been running for 10 years now as a piece of theatre and I watched the thing I was like I want to go see the stick man um, or clowning like uh, Slava's snow show will definitely be back in uh, at the South Bank at some point near Christmas when I'm not in Ipswich and I, I just want to experience some different stuff because these these big machine things they just don't do it for me i can see all the cogs turning from the very first second and they're soulless yeah yeah which makes me feel dirty saying that because i love musicals yeah. i think they're fantastic they've saved my life a million times over and given me great happiness but there's something there's something about the way they're being done in the west end that isn't very what well, doesn't give me much joy. I'm glad if I'm glad if it gives other people joy. And moving away from the bigger venues, what about these smaller venues? Are there any that still catch your eye that you still visit? Well, this is probably the wrong answer, but it's the honest answer. As a performer who who's regularly working in cabaret mostly, uh, if I get a day off, I stay in. Yeah. So if you asked me about Netflix, I'd probably know exactly how to answer you or, or Peaky Blinders. I would have an answer for you. But the, the answer is if I'm not creating my own work um, or, or sharing it with other people or teaching other people how to do it, I'm having a lie down. Um, but like I say, that when I do get the opportunity um, to go to the theatre, I think I'm going to seek out I'd rather go and see something at the Southwark or the Playhouse yeah. uh, or um, uh, Above the Stag or the Donmar even than just go to the opening of the new big West End thing. Yeah. I think that's going to be more interesting. Do you like Victoria Wood? Who doesn't? There are people in the world that don't like Victoria well, Wood. There are people who don't know who she is. Well, yes. <laughs> yeah, there are. And, and we can forgive those yeah. because, the, because they're, they're, they're called young. young. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the ones that do know who she was and don't like her, I mean, do you think those people should be chemically castrated or...? Funny, because my friend Steph Parry did any... I know Steph Parry! She did ah. a, a Victoria... I mean, she doesn't do any cabarets now because she's too busy. Yeah. But during a few of her cabarets, she used to, like, Churn out a bit of Victoria, which is brilliant. She did it She's incredibly as well. Grand is yeah. Steph Parry. I'm creating a Victoria Wood show nice. with um, Sarah Louise Young, who we were talking about earlier, yes. who won a QX award last week. Um, and uh, also, Michael Ralston is the musical director, and he's won uh, a number of awards on the London Cabaret Awards. And he he's currently working with Dilly Keane from Fascinating Aida and touring with Jess Robinson. Brilliant. And they're both very old friends of mine. And so um, we're creating a show called Looking for My Friend, the music of Victoria Wood. I love it. So I and Michael will be doing um, what <laughs> it took one woman to do. It will take two men to do half as well. Uh, we'll be on stage uh, sharing her songs and, and exploring why we loved her. Yeah. Uh, all of us, you know, uh, the audience and, and he and I and how he and I bonded because of her and how the, the, the language is part of the music and of course her accent being part of that too. Yeah. But it's, it's not the sketches, it's not the monologues, it's the songs and stuff like that. Can you do the accent? Uh, it's really because <laughs> some some of the songs you really can't do it without, without doing it. So you exactly. can't. Do, you, you, I mean, if you take Saturday night, you can't. You. Can, I mean, I, so Saturday night is like, oh dear, what can the matter be? Eight o'clock at night on a Saturday, Tracy Clegg and Nicola Battersby come into town double quick. You know. So yes, I can, uh, and I don't have to. I could. I could sing. Oh dear, what can the matter be? What can the terrible? Cl um, you know. <laughs> 
Clunching and Clatterby. It's Tracy Clegg and Nicola Battersby coming to town double quick. But that wouldn't be Victoria Wood. It would be Noel Coward. So yeah. it was a very different... It's a very different sound. It's a very different music. And that's what we explore. One of the things we explore. Celebrate. Yeah. So hopefully that will be in Edinburgh in 2020. But we're starting with a... Uh, a, a an R and D process and a few previews very soon. Yeah, so I'm yeah. excited about that. Yeah, well, that's definitely one to look out for. Yeah, you should come. I will definitely be there and in Edinburgh. I think I'm coming up for the whole month next. Are you? I was there for twelve days this summer, so and it was too much. Oh really? <laughs> it was squeezed in. I was like, I need more time. But it's. I I, mean, I find Edinburgh tough. Forty nine shows in twelve days. Ooh. I so I, I was going to take two shows to Edinburgh next yeah. year because I'm writing a one-person musical with my songwriting partner, Jordan Clark, nice. who is a tremendous 23-year-old yeah. uh, um, composer. He's written nine musicals. He's 23. I was like, do you not masturbate like everybody else? <laughs> Nine musicals, and this tenth one. I, well, Did I don't finish an improv musical. What was it? He's just done an improvathon actually, yeah. uh, and he's one of the showstopper of the improvisers. The showstopper. He's yes, one of yes. their, their. Um, one of their yeah, clutch. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, and he's he's so talented, and it. I think I think people thought I was his mentor for a long time. I'm, he's my mentor. He's half my age and he just comes in here and sort of tells me how to be and how to be a creative and how to be a better person. And I'm just like, oh God, I'm floored by the fact that I'm working with you. And we write songs together. And um, we went around the country earlier this year with uh, my show, Paulus Beta, which was uh, me and him and a drummer and a violinist. And it was sort of half covers songs and half original numbers that we'd written. And the next time we perform it, which will now it will probably be 2021. Um, it'll be a complete, um, I don't really like the word musical for reasons I've just explained, but it will probably be a complete one person musical. Incredible. Yeah, and I was gonna take both Victoria Wood and that to Edinburgh. And then Sarah Louise said, I think you'll die. I think you'll yeah, want to go home after four much. days. Cause it's tough, isn't it? It is tough, especially cause there's so much more to it than just performing. You, you have to market, you have to yeah. fire to get out there, especially if you're a performer. Yeah. You'll be taking your ukulele to the streets. Yeah, to absolutely. Wheel them in. Yeah, and and do open slots at yeah, whatever yes, time of night yeah. an open slot might be available, yeah. and try not to drink too much. Which I think you fail there. I'm not very good at. <laughs> it's not even. It's not even five o'clock. By the way, it's not, is it? But it is a Friday, and you <laughs> it's wouldn't. Anytime have, you want. It's only to because do. you wouldn't have a cup of tea. <laughs> it is true. It's not tea with Wilma. It's, and it's, I just, I, I believe in good service. Wine I, with Phil. As I've pointed out, I believe in good service and I just exactly. wouldn't let you get away with it's, out. It's a good year. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> I think it's a Vermentino because of the Italian husband. There we go. But um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Not Thank you. I was found in a pair of Ugg boots that had been returned to a concession stand of Russell and Bromley in a well-known department store in the city of Coventry. <laughs> city of culture, my ass. Please welcome to the stage, Palmas! <laughs> Situated between the leggings and the fascinated departments, that is where I grew up. <laughs> Sleeping underneath the till, which is difficult when you're 27. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you sing out of tune As long as you're German <laughs> Maybe a good idea this evening to get your head, if you haven't already Around the idea of gender fluidity <laughs> Oh, you shouldn't have kissed me Cause you started a fire And then I found out you're a serial liar. You lied about your status. You lied about your life. You forgot you had three children. You forgot you had a wife. <laughs> Do you hear the one about the one you filled with doubt? Was it worth your while? I see some people in the audience looking completely baffled. Possibly had the ticket bought for them by a loved one. I don't think they've got to change. They've got pills to sell. They've got implants to put in. They've got implants to remove. But I'm not forgetting that I was a boy too. I 
scientists now want to ban glitter. No more glitter. I am 90% glitter. The piano has been drinking, not me. Not me. Not me. Poor. The particular concession stand of Russell and Bromley was run by a kindly lady called Ulith, who drew on her own eyebrows and drank gin in the mornings. And I learnt from her about love, life, and most importantly, men. Now you can go to hell! I'm going to Brazil. Well, no hair there, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Liquor, they say, is quicker, they say. But what I want's even quicker, and it's thicker. <laughs> what good is vodka? I've been drinking eight bottles a week. Can vodka beat a bard complete with godlike physique? I came close to a concussion, choking down my first white Russian, oh yeah. <laughs> I bought me a man, all right, and your wife. God damn it. Isn't there one ounce of decency buried underneath all those layers of fat? 